Hello, my name is Kent Hovind from Pensacola, Florida. I was a high school science teacher 15 years. I now travel the country and speak on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. But for this tape you're about to see, this is one of my miscellaneous tapes in my section on how to make money. The real motive behind this tape is to teach students to get busy and get to work for the Lord and use their life for things that will be meaningful in eternity's sake. We hope you'll enjoy this tape. If you'd like a list of our other materials, you can call or write. We'll put our name and address on the screen. We'd be glad to send you those. We hope you enjoy this now. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> All right, well, it is good to be here today. My name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher 15 years, and I now travel the country and speak on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs about 700 times a year. I do a lot of debates at universities. All my stuff is hands-on. You're welcome to play with all my dinosaurs. But uh, today we're going to cover a little different subject. <clears throat> I need to warn you about a couple of them now. This one, this one is my blondosaurus, so be sure to talk to her kind of slow, if you would, okay? Uh, all right. And it's... <clears throat> Flip that on, would you please? It's great to have... Uh, Great to have all you students here from Rocky Bayou Christian School. This is one of the first schools I spoke to. I guess it's been almost five years ago, brother. When, great when I first got started doing this, uh, first in full-time evangelism, and it's a joy to have you here. But today I want to cover a little bit different subject, not on creation evolution so much. We've got videotapes, and I've spoken at your school a couple of times on that subject. How many of you go to a church where I have been to your church to speak on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs? Okay, great. How many go to a church where I have not been there yet? Okay, how many do not understand the questions so far? All right. Either I have been or I haven't been. Great. Today I want to talk about a subject that teenagers are always interested in. Teenagers love this subject. How to make money. How many of you would like to learn how to make money? All right. <clears throat> well, if you will pay very close attention for the next few minutes, I can give you some advice that will make you a fortune. And when we get done telling you how to make money, I'm going to tell you how to spend money. You say, I already know how to do that. Well, I think you might be surprised on how to spend money. That's really as important, if not more important, than how to make money. If you want to make money, and I have uh, been a school teacher 15 years, which means every summer I was unemployed. You teachers will know what I'm talking about. You got to scrounge around and find your own work. So how do you make money? How do you provide for your family? Basically, you're going to get paid according to what type of worker you are. If you're a good worker, you're going to make more money. So I'm going to give you, in order here, the four basic kinds of workers. And those that are intelligent will write this down because you'll say, ah, this will help me in the future. Those that are not too bright will sit there with an open mouth and stare on their face, and look at a calf, looking at a new gate. So I'll leave this up to you. But there are four kinds of workers. What kind of worker you are will determine how much money you're going to make in this life. The first kind of worker, and I'll have all these on screen for you. The first kind of worker, and Proverbs is full of verses about this, is the kind of worker, he sees what needs to be done, and he does it. Nobody tells him what to do. He sees what needs done, and he does it. There are very few of these in the world. When you can find a number one worker, number one workers, they see what needs to be done, and they do it. If you can find one of those, hire them. I've had very few of those work for me in the course of time. I've hired probably, I'm sure I've hired over a thousand high school and college people to work for me since I've been doing construction work on the side, teaching school every year and then over the summer doing construction. I've hired hundreds and hundreds and probably well over a thousand high school and college students to work for me. I look for number one workers. They see what needs done and they do it. There aren't many of those. I'll give you an example. Uh, Brother Don, are the cans still out there? Would you bring those to me, please? Uh, every one of you got off the bus and walked in. I had some things planted just to see if we had any number one workers in the crowd. Out by the pole, there was a Coke can smashed flat. And then in the hallway, there was another Coke can smashed flat. And I thought, you know, I bet all the students will walk right past them. Now, some of you might have seen them, but nobody picked them up, right? Thank you, brother. Inside each of these Coke cans <clears throat> was a $5 bill. A worker will see what needs done and do it. I have done this probably several hundred times. 
I have only one time ever lost my money. That was last week. First time ever I had a student pick up the Coke cans. When I was teaching school, I would always do this. I, instead of picking up all the trash on the parking lot, I would go tape a $5 bill under a piece of trash with a little note. Thank you for caring about our school and the way it looks. You may have this $5 bill. Pretty soon the students learn, hey, look for trash on the parking lot. <laughs> see, most people see what needs done, but they don't do it. Hey, somebody ought to pick that up. Yep, somebody should have picked that up, shouldn't they? <laughs> you never know what's going to be in there. Example, number one workers would see something, they say, hey, that's not right, and they fix it automatically. Another thing we did before you all came in this room, we messed up every single songbook. None of the songbooks are in there straight. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> now, when you sat down, when you sat down in your seat, there's no money in them. <clears throat> not, not that I put in there. When you sat down in your seat, some of you didn't even notice. Hey, the songbook's not straight. If you noticed and you didn't straighten it, then you're not a number one worker. Number one workers, they see what needs done and they do it. If you can learn to do that, I'm telling you, you'll make a fortune. I'll give you an example. We had a kid at our college in Texas. We'll call him Jeff here for an example. Jeff came to me one day. He was one of my college students. I was teaching and he said, Brother Hovind, I need, I need a job. I said, now Jeff, let me ask you a question. Do you need a job or do you need money? He said, well, I guess I really need money. I don't have to have the job, do I? I said, no, you really need money. You don't need a job. He said, okay, I need money. He said, but I thought I had to get a job to get money. I said, well, normally you do. I said, what have you tried, Jeff? He said, oh man, I've applied to McDonald's and Hardee's and Kentucky Fried and... I said, well, Jeff, if they do hire you, they're gonna pay you 450 or five bucks an hour and they're gonna make a profit off of you, right? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, why don't you work for yourself? He said, I don't know how to do anything. I said, you're in college and don't know how to do anything? He said, well, I can play Pac-Man pretty good, but uh, I said, well, nobody's going to pay you to play Pac-Man or change channels on the remote, you know, boy, I'm really good at that. I said, surely, Jeff, you know how to do something. He said, no, Brother Hovind, I don't have any talents at all. I can't work on cars. I can't build houses. I, I can't do much of anything. I said, well, Jeff, come on. Let me give you an example. Can you, can you clean out gutters? Jeff, are you smart enough to put the ladder up against the house, climb up, clean the leaves out of the gutters, and throw them in a bag? Think you can handle that, Jeff? He said, yeah, I believe I can handle that. I said, all right. Why don't you today start Jeff's gutter cleaning service? You're going to have your own corporation. You're going to be the president and executive vice president in the whole thing. You are the company. I said, I will loan you my ladder for three days. After three days, you're going to have to rent it off of me if you still want to borrow it, because I do not like loaning out tools. I'll rent it to you for 10 bucks a day, because I don't want to rent it to you. Okay? But for three days, you can have it free. Here's what I want you to do, Jeff. Put my ladder on the roof of your car. Tie it down, please. Then <coughs> get a roll of garbage bags and drive down to a neighborhood that has gutters on the houses. It's very important if you're going to clean out gutters, they have to have a gutter to clean out, okay? Drive down, find a neighborhood that has gutters. And you can tell sometimes from the street the gutter needs cleaned out, especially if there's leaves hanging out of it or if there's little trees growing in it. Then you know it's been a while since it's been cleaned out. I said, go up and knock on the door and say, hello, sir, ma'am, my name is Jeff. I'm putting myself through college. I noticed your gutters need cleaned out. I will clean out your gutters for $10. Do not walk up to the door and say, hello, ma'am, my name's Jeff. I'm putting myself through college. Do you have any jobs you need done around here? They will not be able to think of any jobs that need done. But if you saw the job that needed done, and you suggested it to them, and you named a price. In one sentence, you got it all done. My name's Jeff, I noticed your gutters need cleaned out, I'll clean out your gutters for 10 bucks. I said, Jeff, I'm telling you, it'll work. Three days later, Jeff did not come borrow my ladder. We were in a big church, about 2,000 people, so I didn't get to see him all the time, and I saw Jeff a few weeks later, and I said, hey Jeff, how's it going? He said, oh, going great. I said, are you still looking for a job? He said, I don't have time to look for a job. I said, why not? He said, don't you remember I started my own company? I said, oh yeah, that's right. How's it going? He said, Brother Hovind, you wouldn't believe it. He said, I am making $150 a day cleaning out gutters. 
I was visiting my parents' house one time up in Peoria, Illinois, in Groveland, actually, outside of Peoria. As I heard a knock on the door. My mom went to answer the door. This college student standing there had a bucket in his hand with a roll of paper towels in it and a squeegee. He said, hello, ma'am. My name is Tim. I'm putting myself through college. I noticed your windows need cleaned on the house. I will clean out your windows. I will clean off your windows. Don't clean them out. <clears throat> I'll, I'll wash your windows for $20, inside and out. My mom said, you're hired. Just like that. Nobody likes to clean windows. Tim went over to the sink, filled up the bucket with water, put in a few drops of Shackley Basic H, and took the squeegee. He washed the windows, squeegeed them off, got about 90% of the water off with the squeegee, and then used the paper towels to do the corners and keep the squeegee clean. He probably only used five or six squares of paper towel on the whole house. Some of you could use a whole roll on one window, right? <laughs> well, he did a really good job. He was done in 45 minutes. My mom handed him 20 bucks, and he's walking across the front yard. I went out and met him. I said, Tim, uh, can I talk to you for a second? He said, sure. I said, look, I hire lots of high school and college kids to work for me, and I try to teach them how to, how to get self-motivated, how to make money on their own. I said, tell me, Tim, if I could be so bold as to ask, uh, how long have you been doing this, and how much money do you make at it? He said, oh, I've been doing it every summer, putting myself through college. He said, I make, he said, I don't like to work during the school year. I just work in the summer, and I make about $5,000 in the summer cleaning windows and then I can study it during the rest of the school year. Now, if you worked real hard at McDonald's all summer long, you might make 1,500 bucks. But he made 5,000 working for himself. He's a number one worker. He sees what needs done and he does it. Look, if you just learn, that's an attitude, a philosophy of life. Some of you can walk in the house, the dishes are running over in the sink. They're piled up 18 feet high. There are none left in the cupboard. You don't even notice. The garbage is running over on the floor. The grass is seven feet high. The dirt is four inches thick on the car. Oh, I didn't see it. <laughs> That's precisely my point. A couple of students at Maranatha Baptist Bible College, I've spoken up there a couple times, great school in Wisconsin, they were uh, <clears throat> doing an experiment. They went in the cafeteria, sat down in the cafeteria, and dropped some paper on the floor and sat there and watched it to see who would pick it up. Every student in the college, almost every student that came for lunch that day, came in, got their tray, and walked right past the paper and went and sat down. Dr. Winnegar, the president of the college, walked in, got his tray, started walking, automatically bent down, picked it up, stuck it in his pocket, and kept on walking. You say, well, he picked it up because he's the president of the college. No, he's the president of the college because he picked it up. Big difference. You want to be the boss, you better learn to see what needs done and do it without being told. That's the first kind of worker. They will make all kinds of money. Look, if you became a number one worker and you hired in at McDonald's, let's say you already work at McDonald's. I picked that as an example. And you, uh, you're a number one worker. The boss says, would you make some French fries? Oh, sure, boss. And you fry the fries. And then you're done. So you look around and you notice the napkin rack is empty. So without being told, you go get the napkins and fill the napkin rack. Then you notice the straws are about gone, so you go fill the straw rack. And then you notice the counters are dirty, so you wipe off the counters. And you notice the cups are about gone in the cup rack, so you go get some more cups and fill it up. If you would learn to spot what needs done and do it without being told, within six months, you'll be the assistant manager at that McDonald's. Within three years, you will own it. My neighbor in Texas owned three McDonald's. He made 30000 a month off of each one. And you want to work for them for four bucks an hour? Have at it. They're making a fortune off of you. And it's fine. Somebody's got to make money, but that's the number one worker. Man, I wish the world had more of those. And this, <clears throat> it not only applies to making money, this applies to seeing what needs done for the Lord's work. Don't you see there's people that need to be saved? Don't you see when somebody's hurting? When there's another student having a rough time, mom and dad are fighting or something's going on, they're having problems at home. Or Can't you see what needs done? Learn to spot what needs done and do something about it. Some of you, your mom washes the clothes, folds them, well, dries them, then folds them, stacks them up by the bedroom door. You come walking in, step right over them. I didn't see them. <laughs> Precisely my point. Why didn't you see it? Don't you see what needs to be done? You ought to try this today. Go home and look for at least three things you can do that need done. Everybody ought to be able to walk into any room 
and look around and say, ah, that needs to be done. This needs to be done. There's a piece of tape hanging on the light fixture there from a Halloween party, apparently. Somebody should have pulled that off a year ago. <laughs> All right? There's a thumbstick, th thumbtack still stuck in the wall. Learn to see what needs done and do it. The second kind of worker, number two. Second kind of worker, he asks what to do next. These kind are pretty rare also. I love these kind. I've had several work for me. They come and ask, okay, boss, what's next? If you get on a McDonald's and you're a number two worker, when you get done making the french fries like they told you, you go to the boss and say, okay, boss, I'm done. What's next? Man, those kind will make 10 bucks an hour. They'll make plenty of money. It would be best if they were number one and they saw what needed done, but they're not quite that good yet. They're a number two worker. They come and ask, okay, boss, what's next? You can at least do that with your parents at home. Hey, mom, I finished setting the table. What else would you like me to do? Man, those kind are rare. Okay, Lord, I read my Bible. I prayed for the missionaries. What else would you like me to do, Lord? It's just an attitude. It's a way of life. It's a philosophy, a way of living, being the right kind of worker, seeing what needs to be done, or at least asking the boss, okay, what's next? Number three workers. This is probably where most of you fit. Number three workers must be asked. They won't do anything unless you ask them. You come home from school, plop down in front of the TV. Your mom or dad comes in and says, uh, uh, would you set the table, please? Sure, mom. You go set the table. When you're done, you go plop down in front of the TV again. <laughs> then they come and say, uh, excuse me, would you take out the garbage? Oh, sure, mom. Be glad to. And you go take out the garbage. And then you go plop down in front of the TV. You're not going to ask what you can do to help. You're going to wait until you're asked. If you're a number three worker, you will always be an employee. You will never be the boss. Somebody will always be telling you what to do because you won't do it otherwise. I have kids say, I'm tired of parents telling me what to do. All right, be a number one worker and they won't tell you what to do anymore. If your parents are bugging you, is your homework done? Is your homework done? Is your homework done? Obviously, you're a number three. The problem's with you, not with the parents. If your parents have to say, oh, would you make your bed? Would you set the table? Would you cook supper, please? Would you take out the garbage? Would you mow the grass? If they're always telling you what to do, he said, I'm tired. We had one kid at our school in Illinois. He said, I'm tired of my parents telling me what to do. I'm going to join the Marines. <laughs> Boy, are you brilliant or what? You know? <laughs> yeah, the Marines are just going to come in about 10 o'clock in the morning and gently shake you and say, excuse me, it's time to wake up. Would you like your breakfast in bed? Would you like your eggs over medium? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Boy, he did too. He joined up. Man, he came home. He was the shock of his life. After boot camp, he came home. He was sleeping uh, about 7 o'clock in the morning. They went to our church. His mom came in there, shook him, and he, he wouldn't wake up. Man, he was beat. He'd been in boot camp for nine weeks, and he was, he was tired. So his mom said, get up, soldier. He jumped up, stood attention just like that. Boy, they taught him something in there. I don't know what it was. But number three workers, they have to be told. They have to be asked. They won't do it unless you ask them. Now, there's a worse kind. Number four, you say, worse than a three? Oh, yeah. This is where some folks are. Number four workers must be found in order to be asked. You can't even ask them to do the job because you've got to find them first. Some of you are masters at this. You have learned. You know what time dad comes home from work. You got it down to a science. Let's see. Dad comes home at 10 after 5. Here it is, 5 o'clock. If I'm here when dad gets home, he's going to give me a list of jobs to do. So I better figure out some place to be besides here. You've learned, hey, I think I'm going down to Herman's to play basketball for a while, or I'm going to go do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be gone so they can't even ask me to do the work. You know, hey, it's almost supper time. Mom's going to be cooking, setting the table. I better go find someplace else to be. Now, let's see, supper's over. Dishes need done. Table needs cleared off. I better go find someplace else to be. Number four workers never succeed at anything. I've seen them. They never do grow out of the number four stage. When I worked at General Motors in Pontiac, Michigan, while I was going to Bible college there, we had some number four workers. They hired into General Motors, and you never saw them again. There'd be one guy driving the forklift around, and three guys hanging on the back. <laughs> and I'm thinking, their boss is looking for them. <laughs> and that boss is thinking, now where did that guy go anyway? My brother is a tremendous teacher, just a whiz teacher up in uh, Illinois, and he's taught 24 years, 25 years now, I guess, in fifth and sixth grade. Gave me some great ideas for teaching tips. 
I collected for years teaching tip ideas, you know, how to handle certain problems. Par teachers, this may help you. If you have a student, they say, teacher, can I go out to my locker during class time? Or can I go to the bathroom? Or can I go get a drink? Something they should have done during break time. They want to take your class time now to do it. You have learned, teachers, there are some students, you don't trust them to go out in the hallway during class time. They can spend an hour and a half going to sharpen their pencil. How many know what I'm talking about? You've seen one like that. Oh, yeah. Can I go get a drink? Three days later, they come back. Where you been? Oh, the long way to the water fountain. Yeah, I had to go downtown to McDonald's to get the drink, you know. Right. Uh, <clears throat> you didn't say where I was going. You got to find them before you can ask them. Those kind are so frustrating. So my brother said, hey, Kent, why don't you do this? If a kid says, Mr. Hoven, can I go to the bathroom? Can I go get a drink? Can I go do this? And they should have done it during class time. Tell them, sure. But every second you're gone is two seconds after class you sit there in your chair. Double time. A simple idea. Takes them 30 seconds to go to their locker. They owe you a minute after school. Now the pressure's on them to hurry back. See, number four workers, the pressure's on the boss. Where did he go? Where did he go? Where did he go? <laughs> Got to find that guy. Look, don't be a number four worker. If you learn to be a number one worker, I assure you, you'll make plenty of money. Last summer was my wife's and I 21st anniversary. We sat down and figured out how much money we have spent since we've been married. In 21 years, we have spent all of it. <laughs> and then some. How many of you could figure about the same way? It'd be about the same with your, your family, right? Spent all of it, yeah. Didn't take us long to figure that out. Look, it's going to cost a fortune. And if you think you're going to make it working for five bucks an hour flipping hamburgers, and I'm ready to get married, I got me a good job, and I'm going to get married and a couple of kids. <laughs> for five bucks an hour, you are in for the shock of your life. Look, you take your hourly wage and you double it. That's times two for the seventh graders. And then you add three zeros. That's your yearly wage. If you're making five bucks an hour, that's 10,000 a year. You say, 10,000 a year? That's a lot of money. Wait till you got a wife and kids. My son can eat 10,000 at one meal. We go to Arby's, we'll get five roast beef sandwiches. Okay, Dad, what are you going to get? <laughs> I was going to have one of them, son. <laughs> Look, it takes a lot of money to live these days. You better learn to be a number one worker. But if you could learn to apply that into the spiritual realm where you can see what needs done. Don't you think there are some missionaries out there that are hurting that would love to get a letter from home? Why don't you walk down the hallway at your church and see the mission board and say, hey, I'm going to write a letter to this missionary and encourage him. Proverbs 25, as good news from a far country, so is cold water to a thirsty soul. I got it backwards there. Proverbs 25, 25. Learn to see what needs done and do it. Now, let's suppose you got a bunch of money, okay? Here you are, you're loaded. Everybody's loaded, you got a bunch of money. You're a number one worker now. Man, you walk down the hallway, you pick up the paper, and you notice the chairs are not straight. You can walk into the classroom and straighten up the table, straighten up the chairs, chalkboard needs wiped off, you spot it and you do it. You come home, dishes need done, you do it. Garbage needs taken out, you do it. Don't say a word, don't ask for any glory, just do it. Grass needs mowed, do it. Pretty soon your mom's gonna say, wow, what's happened to my kid? And they're gonna start trusting you with more things. So my parents don't trust me. They can't. You're a lazy slob. That's the problem. Okay? If we went, if we took, if we all loaded up on the bus right now, and we went to your house and looked in your bedroom. Oh, yeah. Then we'd find out what kind of worker you really are. You say, can I go there 10 minutes ahead of time? No, no, no. I mean, right now. Maybe you ought to start a deal around your house where if you leave for school in the morning and your room isn't clean, that night, no TV, no phone calls, and no friends over. Ooh, that would motivate them, wouldn't it? Okay, we got to hurry here. Now, you got a bunch of money. You're rich. You're loaded with money. You made a fortune. How are you going to spend your money? How many of you have already spent some money in your life? You've already spent some money, okay? Thousands and thousands, right? I'm going to share with you some ideas of how to spend money. But if you write these down, you write down one, two, three, four, and put a space in between each one. I'm going to give you number four first. I'm going to give these to you in reverse order. So put down one, two, three, four, and we're going to start with number four. This is the worst place to spend your money. There are four places to spend your money, and I'm going to give you the last one, the worst one, first. You say there's more than four places to spend your money. No, there's basically four different places you can spend your money. You can spend your money on things that last 
a few hours. There's a lot of things that only last a few hours. Food, candy, thrills, sporting, sporting events. If I gave you five bucks, if you had found the can and got the five bucks, that means you're a good worker. You spotted it. Now, what are you going to spend it on? Candy. Oh, wow. Food. Look, when you're five years old, kids that are five, the first thought that comes into their little brain is food, right? You give the kid five bucks, <laughs> something for the mouth, right? That's, the, that's as far as they can think. They cannot think any further than their mouth. That's as far as their brain works. Now, how many of you could spend five bucks on yourself on one meal? How many could do that? All right? How many of you could spend ten bucks on yourself on one meal? How many could spend 15 bucks just on yourself, just on one meal? All right, put your hands down. Now, six hours later, you're hungry again. You say, six hours, nothing. It's about two hours for me. Okay. If you spend, normal people eat about 100 meals a month. Three meals a day, a few extras here and there. Some of you I know, teenagers eat a lot more than that. But let's round it off to 100 a month, all right? If you spend five bucks on yourself on every meal, that's $500 a month, just for you. Now, how many of you could fill yourself up just as full on a couple of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a glass of milk, and uh, you could be full for less than a dollar? Well, now think about it. At 100 meals a month, if you're spending five bucks a meal or one dollar a meal, that's going to make a big difference over a lifetime, a real big difference. I mean, huge. Things that last a few hours are not a good investment. Now, you got to have them, okay? you got to have food. How many of you could spend 10 bucks going to see a sporting event? A pro game. Let's say there's a pro game. You're going to go see some pro team play. How many could spend 50 bucks just on yourself on one transportation, food, and tickets to get in? Okay, let's suppose you're going to go to the Super Bowl. How many transportation, motel, the whole thing could spend more than 300 bucks just on one person going to see the Super Bowl? No problem. Let me ask you a question. After the game is over, the next morning, what do you have? You have a ticket stub, right? Little stub. And memory. I saw the game. But you're going to forget about it 20 years from now. It's not going to matter. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just not a smart investment. That's all. Things that only last a few hours. Food, sports, thrills. We went to Disney World one time. Took my family there. Being a mathematician, I got my stopwatch going. And I said, you know, we're, we're here on a light day. There aren't many folks here today. I'm going to see how much time we spend on the rides. Not waiting in line, not walking to the ride. As soon as the ride starts, I start the watch. As soon as the ride quits, I stop the watch. We ran between rides. We were there for 12 hours. It was a light day, not many folks there. We ran between the rides. We got as short lines. We did as many as we could to cram it in there. We spent 29 minutes out of 12 hours. They make a fortune while you stand there waiting in line like a bunch of cows going to market, right? Okay, everybody move up two steps. <laughs> it's, not, it's not wrong. It's just not a smart investment, that's all. It's just learn to invest a little wiser than that. Now, when you get a little smarter, a little older, a little more mature, you're ready for category number three. Category three Remember, I'm giving you the list backwards. You can spend your money on things that last a few years. A car, furniture, clothes. That's going to last a few years. That's a little smarter. You give five bucks to a five-year-old kid, first thought comes into his brain is food. But you give it to a teenager, they're starting to get a little smarter. Clothes. That's still only category three. It's not as good as it ought to be, but hey, it's not too bad. How many of you girls could spend a hundred bucks on yourself on one outfit in one day. You could go to the mall with a hundred bucks and spend it all on yourself, one outfit. Every girl here, right? Now, let me ask you a question. I want you to go to the mall today. I want you to spend a hundred bucks, buy yourself a nice outfit. I want you to wear it. I want you to wear it for six weeks. Not every day for six weeks, you know, but <clears throat> wear it once or twice a week. Wash it once in a while. And then uh, after six or eight weeks, I want you to sell it. You paid 100 bucks for that outfit. 
Nice dress, nice skirt, nice top, fair shoes, purse to match. What can you sell it for? No, Six. Maybe about, maybe about 50, cost. 50 cents at the garage sale, maybe, or $1.50 hanging in. Look, you're not going to get your money back, are you? No. Clothes are not a good investment. Now, you've got to have clothes, but how many of you, how many of you could spend 50 bucks on one pair of tennis shoes? Easily, right? How many have ever seen a pair of tennis shoes that cost more than $100? No. Right? Could you go to Walmart and get a pair for 12 bucks and they work just about as good and save you a lot of, a lot of money? Oh, no, Brother Hovind, I've got to have the kind that pump up. Got to have the pump. You're right. You're missing the point. You can spend your money foolishly on things that are not going to last very long. Cars. I've had 94 cars since I've been driving. I like cars. I've had 52 motorcycles. I got five of them right now. I like motorcycles. I've never had a new any of those. Always had a used one. I fix them up, ride them around, sell them. Since I've been driving, age 16, I got my first Volkswagen for 300 bucks. Drove it for six months and sold it for 600. I thought, hey, this will work. So I looked for another old beat up car, fixed it up, washed it, waxed it, you know, wax on, wax off, karate kid. If it rattled, I fixed it, sold it, and made some money. I thought, hey, this will work. I began looking for old clunkers, buying them, driving them for a while, fixing them up, selling them, making, sometimes losing money, sometimes making money. I kept track for the last 26 years that I've been driving of every car I've ever bought, how much I paid for it, and how much I sold it for. My son, last year, and I, Figured up the profit or loss. Over 26 years, I have made $15,000. Now, that's no big deal. It's only $800 a year. That's not enough to live on. But that beats spending $200 a month on a car payment. Don't look at a new car and say, oh, I can afford that car payment. Oh, no, 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 no. You're looking at it all wrong. Can you afford the car? If you can't pay cash for the whole thing, you probably don't need it. Yeah, but you mean get a used car? might have a problem. The new cars have problems. I worked at General Motors two years. I watched them go together. I'm surprised anything runs coming out of them factories. Right? <laughs> Those guys are only there to get their paycheck. Believe me. Oh, that's close enough. Let it go. I asked our foreman at the shop. I said, uh, we built trucks at our shop. I said, uh, we build 500 trucks a day here, right? He said, yeah, about 500 a day. I said, I see a lot of the trucks after we're done building them, they go over to the repair section where they got to fix something that got built wrong. He said, oh, yeah. Huge repair section. I said, how many of the trucks have you seen since you've been working here for 20 years that did not have to go to repair? He said, oh, I've never seen one. <laughs> Out of 20 years, 500 a day, every one went to repair for something. Now look, cars are not a good investment generally, especially a new one. You are never going to make money buying a new car. You're going to lose a fortune. Okay, we got to hurry here. Number three was things that last a few years. Number two, you're getting smarter now. Number two is you can invest your money in things that last you for a lifetime. If I gave you five bucks and you're five years old, you would only think about your mouth. If I gave you five bucks and you're a teenager, you'd probably start thinking about clothes. If I gave you five bucks and you're a college student, now you're probably getting mature and you're thinking, ooh, I better invest this in my education. Because a lifetime investment like an education, you got from then on. Suppose. Let's suppose you fellas say, I don't know what I want to be. All right, let's just pick something out of the clear blue. You're going to graduate from high school and you have no idea what you want to do with your life. Lots of kids are that way. That's not, that's not bad. Why don't, you go, why don't you get a trade, get a skill to do something? If you spent 500 bucks to go to Okaloosa Walton Junior College here to become a certified diesel mechanic, just pick a trade, diesel mechanic, right? After spending 500 or $1,000 to get your certificate, you have invested $500 to $1,000. But you are now a certified diesel mechanic. And you can make 20 bucks an hour for the rest of your life. That's a smart investment. I was working for a dentist one time, remodeling his office. I said, Doc, uh, what did it cost you to become a dentist? He said, oh, I spent $70,000 going through dental school. I said, $70,000? He said, oh, that was just the beginning. Then I had to set up my office. He said, that each of these chairs is $5,000 a piece. You know, got the buttons on the side? $5,000 bucks for a dental chair. He said, I got three of them. He said, then I had to buy the drills. And he pour, pulled out drawer after drawer of those fancy stainless steel tools. You know, these drill bits that cost this and this and this. And He said, I spent $50,000 getting set up in my office. 
I said, 70 plus 50. You spent $120,000 before you drilled your first tooth. He said, yep. I said, Doc, that's quite an investment. Was it worth it? He said, you tell me. I now make $130,000 every year. I got my calculator. I said, let's see, that's a good investment. <laughs> Investing in your education is a smart investment. Let's suppose you girls don't have any idea what you want to do. My sister did this. She didn't know what she wanted to do, so my dad and mom said, hey, why don't you get a trade? Why don't you become a beautician? She said, all right. Cost her about 800 bucks to go to beauty school. She learned how to cut hair and curl it and perm it and all that stuff, you know, the 210, and the, the, the four basic hairdos, the 110, the 220, and the 440. You stick their finger in a light socket. If it's 110 volts, you get a poof. If it's 220, you get a poof. If it's 440, it's poof. You got to open both doors to let the 440s in, but... She spent 800 bucks learning how to do hair. Then she made, in her own house, cutting hair, many thousands of dollars every year, working whenever she felt like working. Made a fortune. That was a smart investment. Investing in your education, folks, is a lifetime investment. And some kids don't figure it out until it's too late. Some of you are still investing in Coca-Cola. Today is Halloween. Five years ago on Halloween, I sat my, six years ago, I sat my kids down at the table. I said, hey kids, how'd you like to make some money? He said, yeah, Dad. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. It's Halloween night. If you will start right now, I will give you a hundred bucks a year from now if you don't drink any carbonated beverages for the next year. You can only have water, fruit juice, or milk. Any kind of fruit juice you want, apple juice, orange juice, I don't care. Any kind of milk, unleaded, regular, or water. I'll give you a hundred bucks. They said, wow, let's do it. They all went for a year. No, can you imagine no Coke for a year? Yes. Afterwards, I gave them their hundred bucks. We sat down at the table. I laid the hundred dollars in front of them. I said, now, how'd you like to make some more next year? I'll make 120 next year if you go another year. Then I'll make it 140. Then 160. I'll add 20 bucks every year that you go without drinking Coke. Now, if you drink Coke during the course of the year, you, I can't take it. I got to have one. Uh, okay, you can have it, but it's 20 bucks off. And you start over at 100. Today is Halloween. I only got one kid left doing it. He's running the camera right over there. Tonight he gets $200. Made it six years with no Coke. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, wave at him, can Andrew? Wave at the cameraman there. Hey, hi, buddy. Okay. Look. You can do it, folks. Suppose you had all the money back you've ever spent on Coke. How many of you could buy yourself a fairly nice car? If you had all the money back you've ever spent on Coke. Yeah, you'd have a fortune, right? Things that last a lifetime are smarter investment. Now, there's one more. And I want to share this with you before we go, because this is why I do what I do. You say, why do you travel around and talk about dinosaurs anyway? Because of what's coming up next. The best place to invest your time and your energy and your money is in things that last forever. You can spend money on things that last forever. Suppose I gave you five bucks. If you're five years old or if you're not very mature, the first thought is candy. If you're a little smarter, you're thinking clothes, furniture, stereo, a couple years. If you're a little smarter, you're thinking lifetime investment. Education, family, property, real estate. Ooh, lifetime investment. Now, if you're real smart, you'll think about things that last forever. If you gave five bucks to a missionary, he goes across the ocean, wins three people to the Lord. How long is that going to last? Forever. Forever. And if you could learn to invest in forever, then a very special promise comes into play. The Bible has a neat verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. If you invest everything you can in God's service, He supplies all these other things. I've had nine cars given to me for a dollar or less. Out of the 50 motor 55 motorcycles I've had, I bet I've had 15 of them given to me. Now you could work at McDonald's all summer long and save up your money and buy yourself a motorcycle or you can work for the Lord, and when the Lord wants you to have one, He'll give you one. That thing you're working so hard to save up for, that beautiful leather jacket, you've got to save up money for that leather jacket. It's only $250. Hey, okay. 
Somebody's already got one hanging in their closet that they don't use anymore. And if you'd serve the Lord, the Lord would provide for you. See, if you work for yourself, you get what you can provide for yourself. If you work for the Lord, you get what God can provide for you. And let me tell you right now, folks, God is richer than you are. <laughs> Lots richer, okay? If you would just learn, man, what can I do with my time? How can I invest my time wisely? Invest it in heaven. That's going to last forever. Here it is, almost the end of the year. Have you told anybody else about Christ? Have you led anybody else to the Lord this year? Have you been soul winning? Have you tried to bring folks? Is there anybody sitting in church because you led them to the Lord this year? Have you got anybody baptized? What have you done for the Lord this year? Are you investing in eternity? That's a neat verse. And it'll work. You just say, Lord, I got this extra money. I got my Christmas money. I got $300. Lord, what can I do with it? And the Lord says, why don't you give it to that missionary who's struggling? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? Why don't you buy some new tires for the bus? Why don't you do this? Do this. Invest it in the Lord's work, and you'll be surprised how the Lord will take care of your needs. Boy, I wish we'd get some teenagers to see this. What I've just given you will revolutionize your life if you let it. Learn to seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I decided five years ago I was going to drop everything and travel around and talk about dinosaurs because... It's a great soul-winning tool. Folks will come to church to listen to somebody talk on creation and evolution that'll never come to church for any other reason. You can't get them for anything. Plus, Christians don't know what to do with the dinosaurs. Where do they fit in history anyway? Let me close with this story. I was in Texas. One of the guys at our church, an old man, Dr. Julian Pope. Johnny Pope is his son. He's pastor in Houston, Texas. Dr. Pope was a wise old man. I said, Dr. Pope, how do you know God's will for your life? How would you like to know God's will for your life? I said, Dr. Pope, how do you know God's will? He said, oh, Brother Hovind, that's easy. I said, man, tell me. Let me write this down. Got my pencil and paper out. He said, oh, you won't need a paper for this. He said, you want to know God's will for your life? I said, yes, sir. He said, then you find a need and fill it. He said, what's the biggest need you see in the country? He said, don't tell me. Whatever you see is the greatest need, that's God's will for your life. Go fix it. Look, if you showed up at a bus wreck, a bus just ran off the road, ran into a tree, it's laying over sideways, gas is running all over the place, the kids are inside screaming and yelling, and you're the first one there at the wreck. You stop your car, you get out of the car, and you look, and all the kids are screaming in there, help, help, help. Are you going to stand there until somebody else comes along and says, uh, excuse me, would you, would you go rescue that kid, please? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Don't you see what needs done? Until somebody shows up and takes charge of the situation, you can do something. Go get somebody out of the bus, right? Find something to do for the Lord. If you're busy serving the Lord, then He'll steer you off where He wants you to go. You say, I don't know where I want to go to college at. You just serve the Lord now while you're in high school. And the college will take care of itself. Get moving. Look, if you're in a car that's not moving and you turn the wheel, it doesn't do any good. The car's still pointing the same way. But if it's rolling, it's easier to steer for one thing, and then it'll have some effect. Do something for the Lord. If you don't have a ministry for the Lord now as a high schooler, you're failing. You ought to be working in a Sunday school class, working on a bus route, helping in nursery, doing something for the Lord. Everybody ought to have a ministry by the time they're in high school. Write letters to missionaries. Do something. Invest your life in the Lord's work and He'll supply everything else you need. It's a neat way to live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these young people coming out today. Lord, I pray that you help each one of them to examine their heart and invest their life in things that will last forever. Lord, we've got a whole world full of kids that are investing their life in things that aren't going to last very long. There's a lot of kids saving all their money to buy that new car, to buy those fancy clothes. Lord, there just aren't many teenagers investing their life in forever. Please, Lord, raise up some out of this group that will decide they're going to invest in forever and let you supply the rest. Lord, help us to be number one workers. Help us to see what needs done for your kingdom and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much. Now that you've seen the tape on how to make money and how to spend it wisely, the most important thing you can do is to make sure you're investing your life in the proper things. Make sure you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and make sure you're going to heaven. If you're not a Christian, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me encourage you to do that right now. Just pray a simple prayer and invite Him to forgive your sins and come into your life and save you. 
February 9, 1969, I prayed and asked the Lord to come into my heart and save me. There's no magic words, but I just said a simple prayer. I just said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and save me. And that day, he came into my heart and forgave me and saved me, and I'm a child of God now, and I know I'm going to heaven. It's not because I'm good. It's because I'm forgiven. Why don't you pray and ask the Lord into your heart? Or if you do, call and let me know about it. I'd certainly be glad to talk to you and share with you some things to help you grow in your new faith uh, as you seek to serve the Lord. And be sure to call or write and get a list of our other materials so you can get information on those subjects. Thank you for joining us.